Well, tonight we, uh, we continue. Uh, we ended on verse 9 uh, last week, which was not a, uh, a great place to end. Uh, I always prefer to end at ends of paragraphs, although none of these were paragraphs to begin with. And so um, I don't know if I should give preferential treatment to my uh, ESV tra- translators for that. But um, so I'm gonna, we're going to look at verses uh, 9 through 11. Um, We'll start in verse 10, because we looked at 9 last time. And then um, so we'll, we'll read verse 9. I might highlight a little bit of it. Uh, and then we'll read verse uh, we'll look at 10 and 11 specifically. And then if we have time, we'll look at the, the vision that John receives uh, in, in the latter part of chapter 1. So let me read, read that for us. I, John... Your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Right, let's pray. Father, we ask that your grace would be upon us now as we uh, read and discuss and, and think through your word. Uh, Father, give us grace to, uh, to understand it rightly. Uh, Lord, as, uh, as we go through it, Lord, may it drive us to holiness and to hope, because we are, uh, we are your people. We are your, your representatives here on earth now. We are called to great purpose, and we know that victory is ours. And so, Lord, we thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so just briefly uh, briefly reviewing uh, verse 9, we see that John here identifies um, that John is a brother with us, so that he is one with us in the fellowship, and he is a partner with us, right? So we are, we are partners with him. And we are partners in this threefold period. We are partners in the tribulation. We are partners in the kingdom. And we are partners in the patient endurance. Right? This is a threefold reality that's taking place um, right now. Um, and it's the case that John is suffering in this tribulation. Um, and he is, uh, even though he's in the kingdom, in the tribulation, he's suffering um, as a, an exile on Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, right? So because of his preaching and his proclamation of who Jesus is, he is in, uh, he is suffering, uh, at least at the time of receiving this revelation on that island. Again, uh, I'm not sure that he wrote this while he was on the island. He may have written it later, um, but he received it when he was there. Next, it says in verse 10, that I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard uh, behind me a voice, a loud voice, like a trumpet, right? So here John says that he was in the spirit, um, and this is significant and important because what we see here is, again, that he is being commissioned as a prophet, right? So we talked about this a little bit last time. So this coincides with Ezekiel's use of similar language. Uh, I wrote up a whole bunch of Bible verses um, tonight, so if you uh, want to write those down or you want to go back and look those, you can just take a picture later. Um, You don't have to write all of them down. Um, but kind of where I'm at, because I'm, I have printed out, so I'm not going to be turning there. Um, and I wouldn't expect you to be able to turn there as fast as I read them, right? But so John says that he is in the Spirit, right? And this coincides with Ezekiel when he received his revelation. So in Ezekiel 2.2, 2, it says, And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me, Ezekiel 3.12. Then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me, the voice of a great earthquake, blessed be the glory of the Lord from its place. Ezekiel 3, 14, the spirit lifted me up and took me away. And I went in bitterness into the heat um, of my spirit in the hand of the Lord being strong upon me. Ezekiel 3, 24, but the spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. He spoke with me and said to me, go shut yourself within your house. So the idea here is, is that in the same way that Ezekiel was brought up into this relationship with the Spirit, and that's what allowed him to give this prophetic ministry, this prophetic vision to the people. So John now is saying that his ministry is like that of an Old Testament prophet. And so he will communicate as an Old Testament prophet. 
So again, we interpret him as a prophet. So when we come to his, his words, his language, right, we would interpret it like the prophets of old. John then says that he hears a loud voice behind him like a trumpet. And I think this is alluding to Exodus 10, 16 through 20. So in Exodus 16, or uh, Exodus 19, I'm sorry, not 10, 19, 20, it says, On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Right? So this is right before the giving of the Ten Commandments. This is Mount Sinai, right? You have this loud noise. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly, and the sound of a trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Right? So here we see that this, this same sort of revelation that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai is now going to be this same sort of importance and this same sort of powerful delivery uh, that John will receive here. Um, John will now have the opportunity to give testimony to the heavenly Jesus um, as he did the earthly Jesus. Let me put that in quote. Or did I get that right when I wrote it up there? I did get it right when I wrote it up there. Exodus 19, right? All right, now, this took place on the Lord's Day, right? Uh, what is the Lord's Day? Now, I think what we see here as the Lord's Day is referring to the eighth day, right? The day of new creation, right? Um, and so that is why the church no longer worships on Saturday. We worship on the eighth day. We worship on, um, on Sunday, um, the day that Christ resurrected, right? So that's why Sunday morning is when we're here, not on Saturday, right? So I think that's what he is referring to here when he calls this the day of the Lord. And I think this is not only confirmed uh, in the New Testament, but I think the early church tradition shows that the Lord's Day, every Lord's Day, is a celebration of Jesus's resurrection and victory, right? And the victory that is also ours, uh, and so we celebrate every Resurrection Day um, and in anticipation of the day that Jesus will deliver final victory, right? Um, how do some others interpret this? Some others interpret the Lord's Day here as the day of the Lord, right? And they would interpret this as John is receiving this revelation on the day of Christ's great victory. So this is what we refer to as full preterist. Those who think that everything in the book of Revelation um, has already been accomplished, and we are currently living in the new heavens and the new earth, right? Again, that is not the view of the church. It was condemned by the church uh, very early on. Uh, this is not the new heavens, new earth. Jesus has not, um, has not returned um, and, and brought about judgment, right? So this is how they would, some of those would interpret it. Um, others would interpret this possibly um, if they think that John's letter is written early, that the day of the Lord, not referring to the great day of the Lord, but the day that the Lord brought his judgment on Israel. Um, again, they're, um, they're arguing that it had to have been written early. But I don't think that's what we see here. I think the Lord's Day here is a re reference to, um, to the, um, the new day of Christian worship, which is on, on Sunday. Right? Yes, sir? Why do you call it the eighth day? Um, and the idea that, um, so there are seven days of creation in which God rested, and then the following day, so seven days of creation and the eighth day, um, is the day that he, um, that he rose from the dead. Um, so sometimes you can think of it as the first day of the week, um, but the eighth day, um, there is a passage in Ezekiel that makes reference to an eighth day. So that's kind of why I'm saying it, um, but we could call it the first day. But um, those who call it an eighth day oftentimes use that to argue for why it has um, changed, why the Sabbath has changed. Um, I don't completely follow that argument, that I don't think Sunday is the Christian Sabbath. Um, but there is this picture in Ezekiel 12, I think, 
of this idea that that the that the priestly work moves from the seventh day to the eighth day. Um, so, yeah. Um, well, that's a, that's another conversation for another day. I just never heard that before. Yes, sir. Um, when I was a believer, one of the one of the preachers said that Moses actually saw the Father. Yeah, so we don't know. Um, uh, we know that he did not see him fully, whoever he saw, right? Only saw his backside. Right. Um, and so whether that was the Father, whether that was a pre-incarnate Christ, we don't know for certain. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it's one of those things, like, I'm not inclined to think it was the Father, uh, but it is a, uh, it's a minute detail that has no real... Uh, real consequence. So, uh, not something I'm, I'm uh, wanting to argue over. Right? Yeah. So then, verse 11, right? Uh, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to uh, and Smyrna, and Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and Sardis, and Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So here we see again that John is being commissioned. Um, in this further effort, so he's doing, we have this language over and over and being commissioned as a prophet to write what he sees in a book or in a scroll similar to what we had in the prophets of old. Right? So uh, we saw this in Exodus, 7, uh, Exodus 17, 14. Then the Lord says to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Elimelech from under the heavens. So here, we have Moses being told to write these things, right? Um, Isaiah 38, and now go write it before them on a tablet and inscribe it in a book that it may be for the time to come as a witness forever. And in Jeremiah, take a scroll and write on it the words that I have spoken to you against Israel and Judah and all the nations from the, uh, from the day I spoke to you and from the days of Josiah until now, Jeremiah 36, 2. So here is this call, this pronouncement on the, on the prophets of old that they were to take what they received and to write it in books. Now, not all the prophets did that, right? We don't have the writings of Elisha. We don't have the writings of uh, Elijah. They didn't write books. Uh, but here we see that they are these writing prophets are told to write books. And here John has to write these things as well. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that those who were commanded to write in the Old Testament so these Old Testament prophets were also called to pronounce judgment against Israel and the other nations, right? Which indicates here, I think, that John writing this book is going to pronounce judgment on the world and on those unbelievers um, who are in the visible church, right? So what do I mean visible church? So we have what we think of theologically as the invisible church, right? That's the church that's made up of all believers in all places and at all times, right? So there is one, there's one, we can use the word Catholic or universal church, right? And I don't mean Catholic with a big C like the Roman Catholic church, but there's the universal church, right? So if there are believers in, in China, right, they are part of the church, there are believers in Africa or South America or anywhere on the continent, not only today, but even in the future and in the past, right? They all make up the church, right? But then we have what we call visible churches. So Village Park Baptist Church is a visible church, right? When we gather together, whether it's on a Wednesday or a Sunday, we are the visible church, right? So this is what, what appears to be the church. Uh, within the visible church, there are obviously unbelievers. There are those who profess Christ, but are not truly his. Right? Oftentimes that's demonstrated by the fact that they fall away. Right? John tells us in, uh, in chapter 2 of the first letters that, that they depart from us. Or maybe it's 119, is it 219, 119? But those who depart from us prove that they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. Right? So here, with the book of Revelation is going to be a pronouncement of judgment, and we'll see this throughout, a pronouncement of judgment against the nations that rebel against the Christ, that rebel against the Messiah, and it's a judgment and warning to those within the church who are false professors. All right? in, the, in the whole New Testament, um, when you get past Acts, right, and before Revelation, 
So you're talking everything from Paul to Jude, a significant portion of that is be wary of false teachers within your midst, right? And so the book of Revelation stands as a warning against those false teachers that judgment is, uh, is for them, right? And so we see this in Jeremiah chapter 37. We see uh, in, in this warning against, um, against the people of Israel and against uh, foreign nations. We see this in Exodus 34, um, 6 through 7. Uh, in Isaiah, we see this warning both to Judah and to, um, to Israel, to Judah and all the nations. In Jeremiah 36, 2. And in Habakkuk 2, 2, we see Habakkuk being told to write. But then in chapters 1, verses 5 through 11, we see that he uh, that there's this called out of the, of the, of the Chaldeans. Uh, it's difficult to know who exactly the Chaldeans are. Sometimes Chaldeans just refer to Babylon holistically. Sometimes Chaldeans is only referred to, to a people who lived in Babylon in the south. But again, what we see, though, is that, um, that they're going to be used for God's judgment, and then judgment will come upon them, right? Um, so here, the book of Revelation should be understood partially as a book of, of, of judgment, right? Uh, of woe to those nations, those people who rebel against Christ and against his people, and those uh, within the church who are false. Now, uh, we are not told why John is writing to these specific churches, right? So again, it tells us that the churches here, Ephesus, Smyrna, uh, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. We don't know why these seven are picked. Now, I've already said that I think that the number seven here is being used symbolically, right? Seven in uh, throughout scripture has this idea of wholeness or completeness. And so I think he's writing to the universal church by identifying seven, but why did he pick these seven? Uh, it could have been that these seven were significant or predominant. They were the predominant churches in this region of of Asia Minor, uh, or it could just be that they had specific circumstances that that Jesus wanted to speak to specifically. So we don't know why he picks these. Um, there have been many other churches in Asia Minor, uh, but this is one that he, he picked. All right. So any questions about verses 9 through 11? Yes. Okay. And just another question, but a comment mm -hmm. or an observation. I'm just wondering, in verse ten, mm -hmm. it's in the spirit of worship. It's interesting. Just the detail. It says he heard behind him. He heard behind him a loud voice like a trumpet. Mm -hmm. Now a trumpet can be pretty loud. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what you make of, what's the significance of, you heard it behind him, uh -huh. Emmy, and why so loud? Yeah. And why, why, why describe it like a trumpet? Yeah, so behind him, uh, I think that it's, that it's uh, we're going to see that he has to turn to see it. Um, so uh, there's this idea that while he's coming into his vision, these things aren't visible to him. But then upon turning, uh, but I think the loud trumpet is an echoing back to that Exodus 19 in Mount Sinai and the loudness of the trumpet on Mount Sinai. So it, it's saying that, that the Moses, that the vision that Moses had on Sinai is now going to have connections to the vision that John will now receive here. Um, as he's in the spirit. So I think that's the connection there, that trumpet. Okay. okay. Mike, yeah. I, I, I enjoyed it. You made it clear that most likely Moses did not see the farm. Uh, as far as I, as my understanding is that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, uh, so next we have verses 12 through 20. Right? I'd like to think that we could get through all of them, but it's uh, likely not going to happen. But what I do want to do is I want to start with basically an introduction to this whole section. Right? Now, the vision of verses 12 through 20 follow the same pattern as we see in Old Testament visions. Right? 
So uh, I'm going to compare here um, Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 7, to Revelation, uh, uh, Revelation 1, 12 through 17. Right? So here is the pattern. The vision is given. Right? So let me read verses 11 through, or 12 through 16. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow, his eyes like a flame of fire, his feet were like broad, burnished bronze, refined and furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, from his, uh, seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. Right? So here is the vision that he receives. Okay? This coincides with what we see in Isaiah 6, chapters, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. In the year uh, that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, lifted uh, uh, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And the one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the fountains, the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Right? So here, Isaiah receives his vision. Now, what happens next in Isaiah chapter 6? So now verse, verse 5. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am an unclean uh, man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with of, of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Right? Now what is that there? This is his response to the one who, uh, the one who is given the, giving the revelation. Right? Now what do we see in, uh, in chapter uh, Revelation, now back to Revelation, in the first part of chapter 17. When I saw him, I fell his feet as though dead. Right? So here is, you have this vision given, right, in both of them. Isaiah then responds, woe is me. John responds, he falls to the ground as though dead. The last thing is it ends with the interpretation of the vision. So in both cases, the interpretation is given. In Isaiah um, chapter 6, verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Right? So here is this interpretation of this, that he not, need not be in woe, that he not need to be in fear because of this. All right? And then we see the same thing in the second part of verse 17 through the end. It says, fear not. Right? Oh, but, he, sorry, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forever, and I have the keys to death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. And for the mystery of the seven churches, I'm oh, sorry, and for the, yeah, I'm oh, sorry, ask for, ask for the mystery of the seven churches that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the, are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches, right? Um, so here, again, what do we see John doing? He is mimicking an Old Testament prophet, Right? Because these Old Testament prophets stand as the means by which John is, is communicating his revelation. He is acting as a prophet of the Old Covenant, and so we interpret him as a prophet of the Old Covenant. The vision continues to develop the themes of, um, so we'll see through this section, the value, the themes of suffering, kingdom, and priesthood that were already given in verses 1 through 9. But we'll also see here the introduction <laughs> of the concept of Jesus as the great eschatological, eschatological judge, right? The one who comes to judge the nations at the end, that's echoing Daniel 7, right? 
So verses 17 to 18 indicate that it was through um, his overcoming death that he has been afforded to these noble positions. Okay, so the reason Jesus is here uh, in this noble position is because he is the one who has overcome through tribulation. He's the one who's conquered through tribulation. He has accomplished the Father's will and purpose through um, through his death and uh, through his death and then ultimately his resurrection as well. Now in verse 19, we see that John is again commissioned to write everything that he sees. Thus far, we have seen that John functions as uh, Jesus, sorry, Jesus functions as a high king over the kings, as a high priest over the priest. Right? His role as judge is important. Because if the churches do not fulfill their roles as kings and priests through the giving te- uh, through giving testimony when they are persecuted, Christ will come as their judge. Right. So this is the, there is warning embedded into this passage, but also embedded into the book. Right. Uh, and the purpose of biblical warning is the truly regenerate, those who are truly believing, will hear the warning and respond in faith. Right. And so there's a warning here. Right. So if there ever comes a time when you're starting to, to lose hope, when you're thinking about compromising, when you're thinking about denying the testimony of Jesus and the word of God, don't do it because Jesus is coming back to judge those of the world. Right? And he will execute judgment on them. Uh, but they should not have fear of him who comes to judge if they do not compromise and give way to the world. Right? We'll see that um, when Jesus speaks to John. Right, so that's just a brief introduction so to this, this section. Right? So look, let's look at verse 12 then specifically. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. Right? So the first thing that John sees is seven golden lampstands. Even before he sees the one in the midst, he sees these lampstands, right? which are identified as the churches in verse 20. Right? So here, uh, the the interpretation of the text is, comes in verse 20, and it tells us these lap hands represent the churches. Right? Now, what I think we see here is an allusion to Zechariah 4, 1 through 10. Right? Zechariah 4, 1 through 10, it's a long section, but what we see here is that there are these lamps, uh, these, there's a lampstand with lamps on it. Right? Uh, it's, a, it's an unusual passage, and I'm not sure everything that's going on here. Uh, but there's also seven lips on each of the lampstands, uh, indicating that they, they represent speech in some way. Uh, but the idea here is that this these this lamp these lamp, this lampstand with seven lamps uh, holistically um, represents the whole tabernacle, right, or the whole temple. So one piece of furniture with the number seven represents the whole thing, right? The completeness here. So what I think we see here is that these um, seven Lamps represent the the whole church. It specifically represents the seven churches that are labeled or or named here. But again, I think it represents this whole thing. So in the tabernacle and the temple, the lamp stood stood in the holy place, which is the place um, before the presence of God, um, which resided in the most holy place. So um, if you remember, um, this will be a crude diagram, right? So you have the whole tabernacle representing the, that's the outer court, and then in the middle you have a tent, right? Right, and so the lamp stood here, okay, in what we would call the holy place, and this would be the most holy place, or as the uh, Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies, all right? So either way you want to use that, that language is fine, all right? So that's where it stood, right? One piece of furniture representing the whole. And the Jews understood that the light that shined from the, uh, the lampstand represented God's presence with them, right? So light is constantly used uh, as a way of representing God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cloud, 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 cloud. Exactly. All right. So this idea of light representing God, we see this in Numbers 8, 1 through 4. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and say to him, When you set up the lamps, the seven lamps um, shall give light in front of the lampstand. 
And Aaron did so. He set up the lamps in front of the lamps as the Lord commanded Moses. And this was the workmanship of the lampstand, um, hammered work of gold from its base to its flower. It was hammered work according to the pattern that the Lord had shown Moses. So he made the lampstand. Right? So this lampstand stood here in the midst, in, in the presence of God, and shined forth and demonstrated to the people of God that um, that the Lord was with them. Yes, Mike? Uh, wasn't the uh, high priest had both type tombs or in the Holy of Holies? That would be when he goes, yes. So when he went, goes into the Holy of Holies, um, legend says that they would tie a rope to him. Uh, I don't think that's in the, uh, I don't know if that's ever recorded in the Bible, but I think that's according to tradition. Um, that he would do that. I could be wrong. It may be in the Bible, but um, just in case, because if it was unclean, um, the threat would be that he would die. Um, so they could pull him out because no one else could go in or they would die as well. well yeah, Joe? Basically, I understood correctly. Everything in the tabernacle itself, the portable church, is indicative of who, of who Christ is. They, they point to the ministry of Christ That's in right. some way. Mm -hmm. And also, if you run in your study, Pergamos is where the throne of Satan is. Okay. Or you, did you run into that? We, I, I, I have seen that. Uh, we spoke about that um, some time ago. Uh, it's hard to know exactly what it means by throne of Satan, but yes, in Pergamum. There was, there um, was a throne there. That right. Was yeah. Because he, he, he has control over all of the kingdoms of the world. And right. The world belongs to Satan. Yeah. So in Zechariah, the seven lamps also seem to represent the, the, uh, the spirit. Um, so in verse 6, he says, then, then he said to me, this, so this is from, from Zechariah chapter 4 again. Um, he says, then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Right? Yeah. So these lampstands wow. sort of seem to represent the power of the spirit. Um, which will give the people of Israel the power to rebuild the temple, right? So the rebuilding of the temple by Zerubbabel was not to be done um, by their own might, but the Spirit of God would be that which would empower this work to take place, all right? So for John, right, thinking back now, chapter, chapter 12, right, the seven lampstands literally represent the seven churches in Asia Minor, but symbolically represent the universal church, right? the church in all times and all places. The church as the continuation of the true Israel, which I've argued before, right? So we don't replace Israel, but we are the continuation of true Israel, right? And true Israel is not represented by the national Israel, but is represented by the remnant that God always preserved um, in all times, right? So... Obviously, when we look at national Israel, and they're all rebelling against God under the, under the kingship of Ahab, right? That's not all God's people, right? The ones that are the true people are the remnant, those who never bowed to, to Baal, right? Um, and so we are not the replacement of the church. That's what some people argue is that the church replaces Israel. I don't think that's the case. But we are grafted in so that we are now the continuation of the true Israel, Right? Um, just like I believe there will be a, uh, a great redeeming of, of ethnic Israel at the end, uh, but there's this, this uh, continuation of the, of the universal, the church is now a continuation of true Israel, and is therefore drawing its power from the Holy Spirit. Right? Um, so just like the seven lamps um, of Zechariah, um, and the seven spirits are identified here in verse 4, uh, and addressed again in uh, chapter five, verse uh, chapter 4, verse 5. So, here in verse 1 to 4, we saw that there were seven spirits. Um, and I don't think that's seven different spirits. I think, again, the number seven representing completeness or wholeness. Right. The seven refers to the Holy Spirit as being eight, the complete eight, one, the Holy One. Eight, right? Eight, number eight is uh, perfection. Uh, okay. Uh, now, uh, so, so here, the church, as the continuation of Israel, is receiving its power in its purpose, in the same form and same fashion as national Israel did. Therefore, John, for John, the end time temple has been inaugurated in the church. Right? Um, so there, we are now the temple of God's people. The temple, the church is the temple of God, which is indicated by the use of Zechariah 4, 
which speaks of the rebuilding of the temple. So here, Zechariah 4 is about the rebuilding of the temple. He's using that same imagery of seven lampstands. Um, in, in Zechariah, we have, um, we have seven lamps on a, lamp, on, on a single lamp. We have seven, right? And that's representative of the temple that will be rebuilt by Zerubbabel. Okay? And now what we have is seven lampstands showing that, um, that the church is now the true Israel. Right? So we're the continuation of the true Israel, and the church is the temple. We are the place where God now dwells on earth. Right? So we don't go and offer our sacrifices at some building. Right? Um, we are the place of sacrifice. We're the place of living sacrifice. Uh, and I think we see this from Exodus 19.6, which we talked about a couple weeks ago, when it said that the church is the, the holy priesthood, right? Well, we are priests on earth, and we offer our function as priests, not in some temple made by hands, but we do it as the church, right? Because the church is the temple. Uh, so the expectation is that the church will function as priests, uh, who offer the sacrifices uh, in the true temple and tabernacle, right? Not meaning that we're killing animals, but the, 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 the living sacrifices. Yeah, Joe? So temple, the way I understand it, your studies correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the temple will not be rebuilt. And if they want to try to rebuild it, it was finished when Jesus said on the cross it was finished. But the seven layers like ripped from the top all the way down. Right, so. And the tombs outside of the wall of Jerusalem, they came out praising Jesus and praising God. Right. Yeah, so my interpretation is there will not be a rebuilding of the temple. They want to, but, and even that uh, Arabs have said, look, it's part of the wall, they know it would be the temple. Right. And they're going to make a deal with Israel. No one could ever. Yeah, yeah, so some. So some would hold that there needs to be some literal rebuilding of a temple to fulfill some promises. Um, but I think those promises are fulfilled in the church because we are the temple. Um, right. right. And we see that we see that in Paul's language, but I think that's really what John is emphasizing here. Jesus said the temple, you know, kingdom of God is within us. That's what he told Pilate. Right. I don't know if the kingdom of God is within us. I think it's connected to what you said. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure about that. I need to look at that with you. Go back to that verse and look at that. But when you go, when you go um, back to uh, uh, when you made it, God made Christianity the official church of the Roman Empire. Well, it wasn't Constantine. Constantine. It was whoever came after Constantine. Constantine did that. That changed the days because really Christianity was. On the Sabbath was on Saturday, not on Sunday. They did. They went to Sunday so they could continue to persecute the Jews. Yeah. So I mean, there's a lot of things that take place there. Um, the Gentile Church. Um, That's Luke and Paul. Would have never really practiced a Sabbath on Saturday because they weren't Jewish. So the Gentile Church never really did that. Um, you really probably see the end of Sabbath worship of the church um, with the fall of the temple in 70 AD. Right. So it would have happened long before Constantine. Um, and Constantine didn't uh, didn't make Christianity the authorized religion. All he did was make it not a persecuted religion. So you weren't allowed to persecute him. But it wasn't the authorized and formal, uh, the, the, the official. It wasn't until well, it was the official. The emperor or the emperor. Was the it, it wasn't until 396. It was officially accepted, but it wasn't the it wasn't the uh, dominant religion of Rome until later. But yeah, uh, we're kind of getting off we're kind of getting off topic. I was just uh, saying um, the church is the people, not the building. Exactly. Yeah. Right. The church is the the church is the people, not the building. Um, and the church is the New Testament temple um, for God, right? So the seven lampstands, instead of one, uh, may indicate, so in, in, in uh, Zechariah's vision, you have one lampstand with seven lamps. Here, in John's vision, you have seven different lampstands. So the seven lampstands, instead of the one, may indicate that the true Israel 
is no longer limited to one particular nation, but all nations, okay? Maybe a little bit of a reach, uh, but there are some who, who make that observation, right? Um, so now, instead of having one lampstand with seven lamps, right, that represents the temple, temple in, uh, in Israel, you now have seven lampstands, so that the idea is it's not limited to, it's, really cool. it's not limited, to, it's a, a global thing, right? Now, one thing that's also uh, interesting here is uh, in Old Testament worship, right, it was the priest, and specifically the priest, who had the responsibility to stand among the, uh, among the lampstand, right? So here, I think what we see is a picture of, um, we're going to get to Jesus, we haven't uh, seen Jesus in the, in the midst yet, but we're going to see Jesus in the midst here in a second. I think what we see is Jesus functioning as his role as priest, right? And one of the things that the priest had to do was to keep the lamps lit, right? So the lamps had to constantly be lit. They were not to go out. We see this in Leviticus 24, verses 1 through 4. So part of that duty was to keep those lamps lit, right? And now, who is the one who is in the midst of the lampstands to keep them lit? It's Jesus. So Jesus, Jesus functions. The lamp went out. I think that Jesus died. Okay, I'm not sure what that, but, um, but what we see here is that Jesus now is the one who is responsible for maintaining the lampstands, and the lampstands are the churches. So the churches are sustained or preserved by their high priest, who is Jesus, right? Now, um, we'll look at verse 13, and then we'll stop, okay? Uh, because otherwise I'll keep you here all night, all right? So, verse, uh, verse 13. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest. Uh, and let's see, we... Right, we'll try to get to all of it. All right. So here uh, we see that I think, right, and I don't know if anyone disagrees with me. And I'm sure there's someone, but almost everyone agrees with this one, right? Jesus here is the one who's standing in the midst, right? The one like a uh, one like a son of man, uh, son of man standing in the midst of these lampstands, right? And so here he's drawing imagery again. Uh, so he, John here is not just sort of making things up, but he is connecting these things to uh, Old Testament passages. So Ezekiel, chapter 1, verses 26 to 27, and above the expanse, over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne in the appearance of sapphire, and seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with human appearance, and upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it was gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around, and downward from what he, um, from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw it were the appearance of fire, and there was brightness around him. Right, so Ezekiel language, now we have Daniel language, which will be much closer. I saw in the, in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is, ever left, is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And then again in Daniel chapter 10, verses 5 through 6, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in, in linen and a, uh, with a belt of fine gold uh, from uh, a thaz around his waist, his body like the uh, like burl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. Right? So here, uh, John is, is using this language from these Old Testament prophets, right? And having this one who comes in a human appearance, or one like the Son of Man. So here, this is Jesus' most used reference for himself throughout the Gospels. We see it, for example, in Matthew 24, 30. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Matthew 26, 64, Jesus said to him, 
You have said it so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven, and in Mark 13, 26. And then you will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Right? So the Son of Man language is used, the term, the phrase, is used 81 times in the New Testament, most of those being used by Jesus. Right? Uh, now, oftentimes, this is a misunderstood passage uh, or misunderstood phrase. A lot of people think that Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man to identify himself with humanity. Right? So sometimes Jesus would refer to himself as the Son of God. Sometimes he'd refer to himself as the Son of Man. And so some would say what he's doing is he's saying, I'm the Son of God, I'm, I'm God, and I'm the Son of Man, I'm human. Right? And so they would make the argument that this is showing the dual nature of Christ, um, Christ's identity, right? That he's fully God and fully man, right? But that is not what Son of Man language means, right? Son of Man language comes from Daniel 7, and this is this great eschatological judge, right? This one who will come at the end of days to bring the judgment upon the world, right? This is why um, in Mark chapter 14, um, uh, we also read part of it, it's a, it's a parallel passage from, um, from Matthew, but in Mark chapter 14, uh, Jesus is standing before uh, the council that will deem whether or not he is guilty uh, of, of blasphemy. And so starting in verse 53, it says, and they led Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests and all the elders and the scribes came together and Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards and warning him, warning himself. Now the chief priest um, and, uh, and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none, right? So they were not able to find anything that Jesus had done that violated their law so that he was, um, that he was well, that it was, that it was plausible to murder him, that it was legal to, to kill him, okay? For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree, right? So, you know, uh, in other places we see that they would accuse him of wanting to destroy the temple, right? Uh, but they're, they're, when you have witnesses that don't agree with each other, you can't use that as valid. But some stood up and bore false witness against him. We have heard, here it is, we have heard him say, I will destroy the temple that uh, is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Right? I think here what we see is in reference to, to the church, right? Um, but um, in some ways, um, but I think the, the really the ultimate picture here is that he's referring to his own body, right? His own body would become the new temple, right? Mm -hmm. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. And the high priest uh, um, asked him, are you the Christ? the Son of the Blessed, right? And Jesus said, I am. And then he says, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garment and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying, prophesy, and the guards received him with blows, right? So the Pharisees knew exactly what Jesus meant when he said that I am the son of man, right? I am the one who will come as the great judge at the end, right? And because of this, they crucified him, right? Um, now, uh, notice here too that John says, uh, when he sees him, and in the midst of the lamp stands one like, a son of man, right? What does this mean? Uh, John knew who Jesus was, right? Uh, John is, is pictured in the Gospels as, as one of the inner circle, right? Jesus had 12 um, disciples that he spent the majority of his time with. We know he had others as well. But even within that 12, there were three that he spent the vast majority of his time with, right? This is John. Uh, John refers to himself as Jesus' beloved um, in, in the Gospel. Uh, he's the one who laid his chest on Jesus' bosom, um, when they were seat, seating, uh, sitting for a meal, right? So he knew who Jesus was. But what we see here is that even though that John knew Jesus, the resurrection and ascended Christ is familiar, 
and yet different at the same time. Uh, he sees Jesus, but the Jesus he now sees is the magnificent and glorious Jesus, uh, not the Jesus of his humiliation. Uh, and so this is uh, the hope of Christians, right? Because in John's, uh, I believe it's his first letter, and I can't quote the verse right now, but it says, um, we will be like him, right? When he returns, we will be like him. We don't know yet know what that's quite like, but whatever it's like, we're going to be like that, right? Now, as we go through and, body and all that. Huh? Glorified body. Glorified body and all that. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the rapture. You know, got free trip and mid-trip and all that stuff. Well, we're, we won't deal with all of that. But eventually, we're going to get a glorified a glorified body. Now, I don't think that means we'll have a glorified body exactly like he has here, right? Because I think we're going to see some images of deity. And I don't think we... Um, there is a sense in which we are glorified. We are made glorious. Um, but we are not made God in the same sense, right? No. Uh, we take on likeness of God, but not become God ourselves. Yes? Um, I read I heard somewhere that when someone gets the nails to their palm, it's just excruciating into the feet. Oh, yeah. I mean, Jesus is, uh, Jesus is, Jesus' torture on the cross would have been unbearable. Uh, unbearable. But, um, well, actually, they grow as they went through the real stuff through the Right, yeah, but um, it would have been it would have been excruciating. Um, but the the worst part of the cross was not the not the nails or not even the suffocation that came, um, but the but, suffered, but the enduring of God's wrath against sin. Um, that's that's where well, they um, break your legs and you suffocate. Like that. Jesus didn't have to; he was dead dead before they broke the bone. Right. That's when yeah. Was so. Now, um, so here in the Old Testament. It was priests who stood among and tended the lampstands. I don't know where I said this, but here we see that it's Christ as this exalted priest who now stands among the lampstands, among the churches, and it's him who cares for us. Right? So Jesus is present with the churches, means that, it is, that he is aware um, of their spiritual state and the struggle that they are enduring. Right? Um, so, you know, I, I think of uh, uh, even us as a, as a small congregation and and sometimes on a night like tonight, when not even many people show up, right? It kind of feels like, like there's this failure and this collapse. And are we enduring to the end well, right? Um, and here's the good news. Uh, Jesus knows what we're enduring, right? Uh, he's not unaware. Mm -hmm. He is in the midst. He's caring for us. He is loving us. And he is the one who is supporting um, and enduring uh, helping, uh, encouraging us to, uh, to help us endure. Um, but one second. Um, but there is also this warning, right? Um, that Christ is in the midst, right? And so there's this warning that He is in our midst. We are not to be those who forsake our commitments to the to the gospel and go out after other things, because He can easily snuff out our lampstand um, if we fail to uh, fail to endure to the end. So yes, Joe. I was taught, I don't know if you were here, but there's a special blessing when we read Revelations and understand. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, we talked about that in the uh, the first week. Um, so I, I get a blessing when I read it. Um, okay. and, and we all get a blessing when we keep what is written. So when we obey the book of Revelation, right, right. we are blessed, yeah. yes, for sure. Uh, now, uh, very quickly, these are his last couple points. Uh, so he is wearing a long robe, the gold sash. The long robe likely is meant to, show, uh, to, meant to bestow on him distinguished honor, right? Uh, and so as an example, uh, we can think of as the story of the prodigal son, right? So the prodigal son is wearing the long robe. He is the, the elder of the family. Um, and so the long robe shows, that, shows the one of, of honor in, in a family situation, Um and so here Jesus wears this long robe indicating that he is no longer working um, because just like when the father ran, what did he have to do? He had to gird the robe, right? Um, and so if you're working out the field, you don't wear your long robe um, because you have to gird it. You can't work because uh, think about what they're wearing. They're wearing something. They're not wearing a dress, but something akin to what we would think of as a dress. Uh, and you can't work in that, so you have to gird it up. The idea here is that Jesus is wearing a long robe because his work is finished. Um, no longer is he, uh, his, his earthly ministry has finished, and now he is the exalted and honored one. And the sash worn um, about 
Uh, his chest likely indicates his function as a priest who also wore one. So in Exodus uh, 28, 4, it says, These are the garments that they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checkered work, a turban, and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, um, who shall also serve as priests. So this sash likely has some picture of his priestly role. All right, we will end there tonight. Any any final questions before uh, before I close this in prayer? Yes, ma'am. Exodus twenty eight four is um, that is what I just read that the priests wear a sash. Oh, no, sorry, Exodus twenty eight four. The priests wear a sash, um, and so here Jesus wearing a golden sash um, probably has this idea of his priestly role. Joe, a question? I have seven questions. Okay. <laughs> the, the visions. This is a vision, right? Uh-huh. And there's Ezekiel's also a vision, correct? Mm-hmm. So visions aren't necessarily um, uh, depictions of reality and yes. physical reality, I guess. True. I would say. Okay. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Next, you s- yeah, and just to go further there, they're not necessarily depictions of literal, um, literal things, I understand. and they carry symbolic and figurative totally. messages. Yes, totally understood. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned that where was it? Oh. Mm. Uh, uh, I can't find it right now, but you mentioned that the lampstands were depictions of the churches. Mm-hmm. Well, and and yes, um, but if you look at verse 20, Jesus gives us that interpretation when he says, and the seven lampstands are the seven thank churches. You. So Jesus, so I'm making that interpretation, okay, but yeah, thank you. Jesus this, gave it. This was my question. And you left out this word, at least in this Bible. Seven the gold lampstands are the angels of the seven churches. No, no, the stars are the angels, and we just haven't got we haven't got oh, to that verse. Okay. So we'll get to angels. Uh, we'll get to stars and angels and what that means later. Is there is there a difference between the churches and the angels of the churches? Okay, uh, that one I don't want to talk about. Because Okay, this is very interesting tonight, this idea that uh, I've I've never heard before, that the church is the new temple. So there need not be a rebuilding of the temple because there already is a rebuilding of the temple, and the church is the temple. Am I equating that? Can I go there? Yes. Can you look up on your phone? Christ is the cornerstone. Um, the two cornerstone apostles are the apostles and prophets of the foundation. Uh, go to that passage if you can find that for me. Um, so so yes. all this talk of rebuilding a physical temple is a good argument against it. In my view, there's not it's not necessary because the church is being built up as the temple of God. Did you find it? The word is different. Yeah, that probably makes sense. Uh, Ephesians 2. Uh, oh. uh, so Ephesians 2, 19. Uh, so I'll start with 18. Through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of the home of God being built on the foundation of the apostle and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by his spirit. So, so interesting. You know, it is, you know we're going to be careful when you're going from a, a John letter book to Paul, but, but I think that's the imagery. Uh, now, um, and that is because, 
which is why union with Christ is so significant, it's because we're united to him because he is the true temple, because he is the true dwelling place of, of God, which is why in, um, in his, he's standing outside the temple and he says, you know, tear this temple down and three days I'll rise it up, raise it back up, right? Um, and they all think he's referring to a physical, literal temple, which will eventually be right. destroyed. Right. Um, but so. he's talking about his own body, um, back from you know John chapter one, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with us. Um, the Word was right in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Yeah. Um, and then we jump all the way to verse fourteen, and He dwelt among us. That word "dwelt" in the Greek is is the same language that the Septuagint uses for tabernacles. He tabernacled among us, right? So. Jesus is the true dwelling place of God. Um, we also see that imagery in, um, in oh, which chapter is it? Uh, John, when he's speaking to Nathaniel, uh, and he says, you know, Nathaniel's like, you know who I am. You saw me where I was when you, you didn't see me. And he says, you haven't seen anything yet. You're going to see the heavens, the, the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man, right? That's an echoing back to, uh, to the passage we just read in Genesis on a Sunday morning recently when, um, uh, when Jacob receives the vision, and there are angels descending, he's descending, he's like, oh, this is the place of God. But Jesus is saying, I am the place of God, right? So all of this language is Jesus is the place of God, and then, because we are united to him, right, we are his body, if he is the temple of God, and we are his body, we are the temple of God. We are being built up as this great temple. So, yes, so that's why I don't think we need a literal fulfillment of, um, of some of these passages that refer to God's work among a temple, because I think those are identified and fulfilled in the church. Okay. What is the where? What is the verse or the verses that argue for a literal temple? Um, well, they would argue that promises were made, and I don't even I'm not sure what they all are. Um, but old covenant promises that are made about a um, a literal temple in their mind. Um, Right? And, and that's probably even how the prophets may have envisioned it. Was a, They were seeing a literal temple. So they believe in order for those promises to be fulfilled, they have to be fulfilled to a national Israel with a rebuilt temple. Um, where I think John is showing us in a number of ways that imagery and promises made to, to Israel in these literal, literal ways are fulfilled in the church um, not in spiritual ways, not not to do away with, with in, in literal and true ways, but not in ways they first imagined. Um, but I, I can look up, I can see if I can find what are some uh, old covenant promises that appear to need to be. Well, when you read the Antichrist, he says it puts an end to the sacrifices. When it refers to the end times, they envision that there'll be a temple rebuilt in order for. And Christ to stop sacrifices. Yeah. So then the argument is that already happened. That's, that's always the argument. It already yeah. happened. Yeah. So yeah. So if you if you see the Antichrist as being something that has to be future, then you would need a new temple being built. But if you think that John is referring to things that have been fulfilled in his day, uh, we'll get to that passage and I'll make my argument for why that's why I lean. Um, Daniel says he'll put it in. I'm in time prophecy that he'll make a covenant with many. And he goes through the seven year, breaks it up for half, half the time, and then puts an end to the second place. Yeah. 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 That's really where he um, Yes, Joe. I'll get like back to you, Dan, but let's go to Joe for a second. I got it like this. Like, the church is the people, the same as the temple is Christ. Yeah, you can think of it that way. And from we're yeah. the saints. Actually, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a physical building. Right. right. Yep. Dan, to another. Just, just regarding the lampstands. Uh huh. Okay. We saw, we saw seven golden lampstands. Are these lampstands? In my brain, are these this menorah thing that you? Um, so, the, the, in, in Zechariah's vision, he saw something that looks like that, okay? So, one lampstand with seven lamps, right? John's vision 
is not one lampstand with seven lamps, but seven different lampstands. Okay? okay. So John's vision is, single lamps. is, is yes. Yeah. Yes, so they're candelabras. It's so one lamp with one stand with one flame. flame. One flame. So his vision is different. Um, so I think he's connecting it. So here in Zechariah, he sees one lamp, seven lamps, representing all the furniture of the temple, representing the whole temple that needs to be rebuilt, okay, which is rebuilt, the second temple. Um, so that's Zechariah's vision. And so now, John's vision, he sees seven lamp stands. So we still have the same number, although it's a little bit different. But it doesn't represent a physical temple. It represents the spiritual temple, um, the, the temple that is made up of the church. Sure. Because the seven lamps are, the, the, the seven lampstands refer to the seven churches. And we know that because Jesus gives us that interpretation. Right. Mm -hmm. Jesus standing in the midst of the churches, mm -hmm. we can say. Okay. So Jesus standing in the midst of the churches. And because I think what we see here is temple imagery or tabernacle imagery, Jesus is standing in the midst of the temple. Because the seven lampstands represent the new temple. So standing in the midst of his people, right? Yeah, so he's, he's standing in the midst of the churches, and at the same time, that means he's standing in the midst of the temple, of the new temple. <laughs> okay. A lot of imagery going on. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's all I got. Okay. Jason, did you add anything on Brad tonight? Feeling good? Joe, you got anything? Good? Questions? You good? Yeah, I was just checking on something. Okay. Good? You take notes tonight? All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, your mercy, your kindness to us. Father, how assuring and comforting it is to know that our that our great priest is standing in the midst of your churches. Father, you see what we endure. You see our perseverance in the faith, our perseverance um, in the midst of tribulation. Father, we pray that you would not let our lamp go out, that you would sustain us um, to the end. So Father, we ask for that grace. Father, we pray that as we continue to, to wrestle with your word, and to, uh, to look at all the imagery that comes here, uh, Father, again, that even though at times it might perplex us, perplex us and confuse us, that ultimately what is most important to be seen. That Christ is the victorious one. He is the one who will come to judge the living and the dead. And as long as we do not forsake our, our covenant with you, that you will preserve us to the end. And we who endure will be kings in the new heavens and new earth. We will delight and enjoy you forever. So Father, may your word give us encouragement and may it warn us to prevent us from falling away. Father, we love you. Christ, we love you. Thank you for your accomplishments for us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit which empowers us even now. In Jesus' name, amen.